Hello, everybody. How y'all doing, Grace Conference? Oh, y'all don't sound excited enough for me. I said, how are y'all doing today, ladies? Y'all look so beautiful. It's so beautiful. I'm sure, Let me see if I can get myself organized up here. A life in balance, God's masterpiece. How many masterpieces do we have out there today? I'm so excited, you guys. I, I, I'm just always excited about everything. I just believe that any opportunity that God gives you to uh, be with beautiful women of God and to just serve him however that is, it's an exciting time, right, right, right? So when the committee called me and gave me my topic and they said, well, you're going to talk about what do you see when you look in the frame? And it kind of caught me off guard because I was expecting her to say, well, what do you see when you look in the mirror, right? That would have been easy. That's not an easy. I mean, that's an easy one to do. But it said, what do you see when you look inside the frame? And so it really challenged me, and I dug deep, and I found this scripture. Let me see how I can work this clicker. I hope I can get this right. Where do I point this? There we go. Hebrews 11, 1 and 3. And this is the King James Version. This is what I grew up with. And this is a very familiar scripture, so many of you know it. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were, met, were not made of things which do appear. Now, it says in there, the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, what jumped out about that scripture to me was, not so much as the now faith is the substance of things hoped for, we know that. But it's talking about the world. God made the world. The world framed, jumped out at me. And I want to know, what are you saying about your situation? How are you framing your situation? What you have or what you don't have, it depends on your words. And a life in balance, that's what this conference is all about, living a life in balance, depends on how you frame your situation. Now, God framed the world with his words, right? He said it, and it was so. And so if we are like God, if we were created in his image, ladies, did you know that we have the power to frame our day with how we talk about it? Just as much as we can say about it, we have the power to frame each and every day. And so, again, when I looked at the scripture and I saw the word framed, it reminded me of a few months ago. I took a trip to Michael's MJ Designs. Any ladies, any crafters out there? And so I needed to get a custom frame made for, I had this, this image printed out of my logo for my company, and I had this image printed out, and it, the image was only about $27 to have them to print it out, but it was really big and it was shaped kind of kind of weird. It wasn't just the average where you could just go and pick up a frame and stick it in there. It was really big, so I had to have a frame made for it. And the shape of it and all that stuff required me to get a custom frame made. So I began to go back there where they, you know, y'all know where it is in Cedar Hill, you go back there, and she, she tells you, and they have all the little designs, and, you know, they have the leather frames, they have the wood, they have all kind of fancy stuff, right? So she pulls up her computer, and she's like, okay, well, this is the size of it. She types that in, and she begins to ask me, well, what type of frame do you want? So I'm real fancy with it, y'all. I'm like, oh, I want that leather one. That's cute. That's, that'll be nice in the office, real sleek looking. You know, I want the glare-free glass, you know, all that stuff, right? I'm just letting it, you know, she's just typing. She's not saying nothing. She's just typing. <laughs> Didn't say nothing. And so I'm like, okay. So, you know, by the time I even got the warranty on it, y'all, who, 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 who gets a warranty on a picture frame? I don't know. Who does that, right? So I'm just getting everything. So then she says, um, you know, is this everything? Is this how you want it to look? She even printed it up where I could see what it's going to look like when it's done, everything. It's got it going on back there. So I said, yeah. So I'm thinking, you know, I have no, I, this is the first time I've ever gotten a frame made. So I have like absolutely no frame of reference for how much these things cost, right? I only paid $27 to have the person to print out the print. So I'm just thinking, you know, my mind is a little closer to the 27. <laughs> and so she was like, um, so if you get all this and you go do this and whatever, it's going to be $457. 
Y'all know how you get to the grocery store and your bill don't come up like you need it. You start telling her to take stuff out the basket. Yeah, that was happening. That was happening all up in there, all up in that area. And so what I found out, and she, then she went trying to talk about, well, we have 50% off. Yeah, that's more like it. You better start coming on down. What I found out was that the frame was more expensive than the image I was putting in the frame. It's, it's important how you frame things. A lot of tough conversations can be had, and you can be successful in having those conversations if you frame it the right way. A lot of conflict can be avoided in your life if you learn to frame it the right way. So, because I couldn't even hang the picture correctly in my office unless I used thumbtacks or something, and we know we're not having that, right? So it had to, I couldn't even hang it if I didn't frame it the right way. Now, has ever, anybody ever been photobombed? You know, we big on social media. We're a social media generation, right? We take, we always taking pictures. The camera is always going, right? Has anybody ever been photobombed or is it just me? One person, two people? Nope, nobody ever got photobombed before. And so photobombing is when, if you're not familiar with what photobombing is, it's when you take a picture and you think you got a real good shot until you go back, girl, let me see what, it, let me see the picture. And then you got Johnny back there doing something crazy in your shot, like, you know, he's all up in your picture, right? And so only, you see only later that you thought you had something good, but then you go back and you look at it again and you see something in the frame of that shot that should not be there. Now that's a pretty, it's not hard to correct or remedy a photobomb shot because they have this feature on your, on your camera that on your phones where you can crop out anything out of the picture that doesn't need to be there, right? Has everybody kind of used that? Everybody familiar with that? You can edit things out of the frame. Now, it doesn't mean that it wasn't there to begin with. It doesn't mean that it wasn't there to begin with. But did you know that you have the power in your own life to control what's going in your frame? You have the power to remove anything that doesn't fall in line with where you're trying to go. When you're trying to, and God is telling you to go somewhere and, and fear shows up, you have the power to crop fear out of your frame. When, when, when you're trying to get some things correct and, and, and that old you starts showing up, you know how you have the little angel on one side and you have the little devil on this side and this one right here is trying to show up in the middle of that situation. You have the power to crop whatever that is out of your frame. Now, when I think about that, I look at Peter in Matthew 14, and there's a, there's a couple of stories, a couple of miracles that Jesus had. This was right after he had fed the 5,000. And Peter, um, Peter is talking about when Jesus, he sends his disciples ahead of him after he's fed the 5,000. You guys can go back and read it later. It's a real good story. It's in the Bible. It's in there. Jesus sends his disciples ahead of him in a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee. And while they're on that boat, they become faced with a storm. And then what happens is Jesus, he, he comes to them. While they're out there on the sea and, and in that storm, Jesus, he comes to them. But you know Jesus, he don't do nothing regular, right? Nothing regular. He comes to them walking on the water. He comes to them walking on the water, and the disciples, they're thrown off by it. They, they thought they saw the ghost. But, of course, Jesus let them know, well, you know, take courage. It's me. Don't, don't be afraid. Chill out. And so here comes Peter. Everybody know Peter. Everybody know Peter. He always got something to say. He always that brother that's got a response, right? So here Peter is, and he's saying, well, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come on the water to you. And so Jesus like, oh, well, okay, come on, come on, come on. So Peter steps out of the boat, and he starts walking. Now, this is the caveat. This is the twist in the plot, right? Peter is walking on the water in the middle of a storm to Jesus. But what happens to Peter is he begins to take his eyes off of Jesus, and he begins to look at the winds and the waves, and he begins to sink. Now, did Peter begin to sink because he actually couldn't walk on the water? No, because he did it, right? He got out of the boat. He took a few steps. He did it. Did Peter begin to sink because he didn't try hard enough? 
no, he gave us some effort. He, he gave us some effort. But what happened to Peter is he was photobombed. Some things that shouldn't have been in his frame got in his frame and distracted him. And like Peter, many of our lives, when we're really setting out to do something great, it's not because we don't want to. It's not because God has not given us the ability. It's not because we didn't try hard enough. It's because we got photobombed and we took our eyes off of Jesus. We took our eyes off of Jesus. Now, I want to know, are there some things that we need to crop out of our life that's keeping us distracted? We're not able to move forward. Sometimes we can't really figure out why, but are there some things that God is telling you to crop out of your frame that you refuse to crop out? And it's causing you to not be able to move forward in what God has for you to do today? There was a a few, um, this has been a while back, but I'm very, you know, I love Dennis. I love dentists. Do we have any dentists in here today? Anybody a dentist? Anybody ever been to the dentist? There's one dentist. Any everybody been to the dentist? Let me see if I can get some hands with that one, right? Okay, a little bit better. So I had some wisdom teeth that were giving me some real issues. And there was this one tooth, this one in particular, and I mean, it was not letting up, right? And so I, was, I just finally got fed up. I mean, like, literally. And it's so funny how something that small can cause that much pain, right? Sometimes so much pain to the fact that it paralyzes you. You're not able to do anything else. And so I finally got up the nerve to go to the dentist. Because I, one thing that I'd heard about having your wisdom teeth, if you do them all at one time, generally sometimes they got to knock you out and you got to go under this anesthesia. And you know me, I'm like, I, you know, it just was something that was just had me really up, really scared to go under the anesthesia. So I'm like, well, if there's anything she say I can do to where I don't have to have them taken out, like maybe she can give me a shot or just something. So I wouldn't have to go under this anesthesia. But I got to the dentist and of course her response was, you're going to have to have them taken out. And that was my cue to get up, get my things. I got all my things. <laughs> and so uh, I found the nearest exit. And on my way back to my home, I began to come up with a strategy of how I was going to cope with this tooth because I wasn't going to do what I needed to do, which was to remove it, to remove the source of pain. And so what I did was I got real smart and I went where, you know, where there's a plethora of knowledge and I started to Google it. (laughs) Went to Google, all knowing. And I began to look at ways to remove the pain or to deal with pain with wisdom teeth. So I was taking everything, doing everything. And one thing I started doing that I didn't really, I didn't really Google it, but something that I started doing was I started chewing on the opposite side of my mouth of the tooth that was giving me the problem. So I started moving everything over to the other side. Instead of removing it, I started chewing on this side. And so what I was doing was I found myself developing coping mechanisms coping mechanisms to deal with something that I just really needed to go ahead and face up and remove it from my life because I had that power. But I didn't want to sacrifice. I didn't want to go through the pain to get to the other side of that thing. So I began to deal with coping mechanisms that allowed me to function with the dysfunction. I'm going to say that again because somebody missed it. I began to make coping mechanisms around this issue that allowed me to look normal on the outside but body racking with pain on the inside. I want to know, are you trying to cope with what you need to crop? I want to know, are you trying to cope with something that you just need to crop? Because God has given you the power, ladies, to control what goes in your frame. Now, my next thing that I want to talk about, that's the first thing, frame. Everybody say frame. Next is focus. Now, I have a little picture here. I'm sure you all have seen this picture before. Has everybody seen that picture before? So what, and everybody's probably seen it, so I'm not letting the cat out of the bag. What the picture is, is a picture, you can see an image of a young lady. She's facing back. You can't see her eyes, but you can see her eyelashes, and you can see her nose facing to, yeah, my left over here. And then there's an older woman. You can see her. She kind of has a big nose with a bump in it, and you can see her mouth. You can kind of see her profile there. And you can see two images in that picture. Now, in every optical illusion, this is what's called the optical illusion. So in every optical illusion, there are going to be two images. 
of perceived image and reality. Perceived image, everybody say perceived image and reality. And so when you have an image like this, what you see depends on where you place your focus. There's a young woman and there's an old woman in there. And I want to know, are you focusing on an old season of life? Where are you placing your focus? And something that comes up for me in the Bible is Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. And you can turn there if you have your Bible. But quickly it says, there is a time for everything and every season for every activity under the heavens. Let me read that again. I kind of messed that up. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. Did you know that God operates in times and seasons? Every day, every, every moment, we're transitioning into something and out of something else. And sometimes when we, when we are, are trying to create a life in balance, that's what this whole conference is about, right? We're trying to balance out our life. Some of us are out of balance because we don't know when one season of our life has ended. And some of us are stuck in old seasons because we're placing our focus on an old season. Maybe, it, maybe, it's, maybe I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Maybe it's because you had success in that season. Maybe it's because you felt God in that previous season. And that's where a lot of people get messed up because when they've had success in an area, a lot of times instead of moving into something new that God wants you to take you into, you spend your time trying to get back to that old place. But what that tells me is if you're steady trying to get back to something, then that means you're not growing and moving forward with God. And, and this is a lot of times where people get stuck in comfort zones and they get stuck in areas of familiarity. And I'm telling you, God does not do the miraculous in your comfort zone. He's never going to do something or use something that's familiar to you to bless you. He's not going to use something that's familiar to you to cause you to bless other people. And so my question to you is today, when was the last time you took time to assess what season of life you're in? Where are you placing your focus? Do you have an awareness of where you are? Or are you just waking up in routine, doing what you've always done, doing what worked in the past, trying to make that work for now? And a lot of times what we find out is when seasons are changing in our life and God is trying to move us to something different, a lot of things that we used to do and we could do it very easily and we could jump over hurdles and flip through hoops and I mean, we were just doing it, right? But a lot of things that we used to do, when it's time for that to be up and God is trying to move us to something new, it becomes hard for us to do it. Something that was once easy becomes hard because our grace for that is up. And so what happens is, and I'm not just talking about the grace that God gives you that he doesn't give you what you deserve. I'm talking about the power that God will endow you with to do whatever it is for that assignment that he has on your life for that time and season. And it's so important that when you're talking about living a life in balance, being God's real masterpiece, you have to understand what God wants you to be giving your time to right now and what he does not want you to be giving your time to right now. Because this is the thing about God's timing, and God does not operate in time. Time is for us. He places us in time. And so we have to realize that it's not our job to change God's timing. It's, it's our job to recognize God's timing. So we try to spend our time trying to change it. And this is the thing. I have a daycare center. And so everything that we do for the children there has to be age appropriate. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the, what the infants are doing in the infant room, they're not going to be able to do that in the school age room because why? It's not what? Age appropriate. So what the preschool students are doing, the toddlers are not going to be able to do that because why? It's not what? And so a lot of times when we are looking at things and a lot of times we look at other women and like uh, Ryan was talking about how we admire people and we see things other people are doing, a lot of times we desire those things. And there's nothing wrong with, a, a, you know, aspiring to be somewhere in life or aspiring to do some things. But how many of you know that there are many times, because God loves us and he's invested so much into us, a lot of times God will not give you certain things that you desire, not because he doesn't want you to have it, but because you're not ready. It is not age appropriate. 
Because when God gives you something and when he takes you to another level, he wants you to be able to sustain on that next level. And so there are things we have to go through. There are things we have to endure to be able to build up those certain tenacity muscles, to build up that patience that she was talking about in order to be able to stand on the next level. And so this is the thing about God. A lot of us are not spiritually mature, and we have to be honest with ourselves. How many of you know the best way to improve yourself is to be honest with yourself about where you are? And so there are a lot of things that we really, really, really want, and it's not that it's not in God's will. It just may not be in his will for us right now. So that's why it's important to understand what season of life you're in and where you're putting your focus and what season of life you're putting your focus on. I was doing some research, and I'm a statistics person, and I found out that the highest rate of accidents are between teens and elderly, teenagers and elderly. And what that tells me in the spirit realm is that a lot of times if you get things too early and don't understand the importance of it and don't understand what it means and all the impact that you can have when you get it, or if you stay in something past the time for you to be in that, when you really should probably move on to something else, what happens is, is you end up doing more harm than good. And, and you doing that, you getting it too early or you staying in it past your time, it doesn't just impact you. Just like those teenagers and those elderly people on the road, it doesn't just impact you, it impacts the people that are driving. It impacts the other people, right? And so... A lot of times we have to realize that what we were able to do in our 20s, we're not going to be able to do when we turn 60. And that's okay. And that's okay. You have to flow with the changes. A lot of things that we could do when we were single, it's not going to be able to be done when you're married. And that is okay because it's a new season of life and you have to flow with the season of life that you are in. And that is okay. And so some of us are trying to do the same things that worked in a previous season and make it work for this season. And it's getting hard because we're not flowing with what God wants us to do. How many of you know you can't bring a blockbuster anointing into the Netflix society? Look at your neighbor and say, it won't work. It won't work. What worked in the last season is not going to work in this season. And here's something else. God is not going to do in your life what he's doing in somebody else's life. And he has a reason for that. And some of us are allowing things like jealousy, things like envy to creep subtly. and Because that's how those things work. They, they creep subtly in our heart because we're looking at what God is doing and how he's blessing this sister in, in what he's called her to do. And that's the thing. Sometimes we try to take scripture and we try to fit it and mold it to our situation to try to defend why we just need to try to be ourselves, and we say, well, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, you really can't. You can't point that promise at every pathway. You can do all things according to what God has called you to do. So you try, your all things is trying to do what somebody else is doing, and we try to quote that scripture to try to defend when we just need to be ourselves. Can I get an amen? Amen, lights and wall. So we have to realize that, that God, is, it's no, and everybody saw the Olympics a few months ago, everybody watched, kept up with that. Wasn't it amazing to just see how those athletes, those human athletes had so much power, so much strength, so much discipline and determination. And I was looking at the, what was the Fabulous Five, was that their name? The gymnast, the gymnastics team, the what? The final, oh, child, I done gave them a new name. <laughs> the final five, come on somebody. And just looking at how amazing those young women were, right? Now, wouldn't it be crazy of me to allow myself, knowing I'm not going to do none of what it takes. I'll do some stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm disciplined around a lot of things, but tell my, that kind of training that they have to endure, that's not for me. It's not for me. I'm not saying it's not for you. I'm saying it's not for me. So wouldn't it get, be crazy of me? to be jealous and to envy where they are. 
and to envy how God has elevated those young women because of their sacrifice, because of their consistency, because of their discipline around that. Some of us want to change the world, and we won't even change what time we get up in the morning. But then you want to be jealous of another woman that's prospering in what God has called her to do, who's made the sacrifices to get that level of success. Oh, come on, y'all. Don't, don't leave me out here by myself. We have all been there. But if you know that you're not going to sacrifice to get to that level, it's no sense in you trying to be jealous of that person. But do you. Whatever God has called you to do, do that. And do it excellent because this is the thing. A lot of us are looking, well, it's not that much. It's not this. It's not the uh, sexy gifts. Can I say that in here? <laughs> it's not the gifts. Okay, let me, let me reframe it. It's not the gifts that are flashy. It's not the gifts. <laughs> Y'all done threw me off. I forgot where I was going with this whole thing. I, the whole thing is just derailed off the tracks. <laughs> it's not the flashy gifts. So a lot of times we get discouraged because it's not flashy and we think it doesn't contribute. But everybody has a place. Everybody has something that they can do in God's kingdom. So you have to appreciate where God has you because everybody, have you ever heard of support staff? A lot of CEOs could not be a CEO and do what they do well without their support staff. So don't ever think what you do doesn't matter. Just because it's not something flashy, just because it's not something that people can see. Filter, everybody say filter. You have to have the right filter. How many of you love Instagram? Two people? Oh, y'all, come on. Three. Three, come on, three, team three. Okay, let me ask it this way. Y'all know what Instagram is, right? Oh, my lamb. Okay, so Instagram is a social media platform that is image driven. So you have images, and you can put a caption on those images, right? And uh, what Instagram is known for is called the filter. They made the filter famous. Like, nobody was talking about filters. It was unheard of. It was just not something that average people did. So they made the filter famous. And so what a filter does is it's not, it doesn't change the image. It doesn't change the reality of the image, of what the image is. If I take a picture of you, it's still going to be a picture of you, but I'm going to put a filter over it. And what the filter does is it enhances the image in some way. It enhances it, whether that's, now Now I will tell y'all this, who knows what Snapchat is? There you go. She over in the corner, she knows. Snapchat has filters too. Now Snapchat filters are really off the chain, like because Snapchat, they let you put these little faces and all this stuff. And they even have these little flower things where you can put these crowns in there. So if your edges are not uh, submitting to the will of the Lord that day, Snapchat got you covered. So what a filter does for you, let me get back on track, is it makes a not-so-great reality look better. It doesn't change your reality, but it enhances your reality. So some of us have some realities right now, some circumstances that are not so great. It's our reality, but it's not the best situation. But when you look at your frame, that picture, your reality, that thing that's in there, through your, what filter are you putting on it? Do you see failure or do you see feedback? Do you see a hopeless struggle or do you see through your filter an opportunity to be made stronger? Do you see a setback through your filter? Or do you see a chance to start over this time wiser and stronger? Are you looking at what you stand to lose from it? Or are you looking at what you stand to gain from that situation? 
And so what I want to leave with you today, ladies, is that we've got to learn to look at life through the filter of faith. Everybody say filter of faith. Because this is a faith walk. I coach people on how to start their businesses, how to do this, how to do that. And I can give you all the steps there are to do that. But if you don't catch the faith thing, having all of that stuff is not going to do you any good. And life is just like a pile of puzzle pieces. That's what God will do when we talk about life and talk about getting to our destiny and purpose. And I think destiny and purpose are buzzwords for a lot of people. People don't really understand what it really, 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 really is going to take. How many reallys was that? A lot of reallys. Because sometimes God will give you a pile of puzzle pieces. You know, puzzles are all good as long as you got the box, right? Because the box does what for you? It lets you look at what it's supposed to look like when you get to the end. Well, see, God, he don't have puzzle boxes where he, where, how he do it. He just give you the pile of puzzle pieces. So you don't know what it's, you just, all you're working with is puzzle pieces. You don't know if it's supposed to be a, a puppy or, or, you know, a river, whatever. Like, you have no idea what it's supposed to be. And that's where faith comes into play. Because God is not going to tell you. Some of us are waiting to act when God gives us clarity. Some of us are saying, well, God, if you tell me who I'm going to have to lose, then I'll run for you. So I can just prepare myself, prepare my mind. If you tell me what I'm going to have to give up, then I'll do what you told me to do. But, but we're not able to see. God's not going to give you the box. We're not able to see what it's going to look like when we're finished. We're not able to see what we're going to have to let go because God is saying, if you just trust me, we're waiting for clarity before we act. But I believe this, clarity comes with action. That's why we have to rely on God to order our steps each and every day. We're trying to plan for the next year, and we haven't even planned for what we're going to do with the next 24 hours of our life. We have to ask God to order our steps on a daily basis. And the more that you act, I have seen this. When you take steps, divine providence will move with you. And it will begin to open up things. And we have to realize that we're going to have to let go of some things. Some of those things have first and last names. I'm just saying. They do. But you have to realize that you're going to have to turn down things that don't fall in line with the purpose for your life. And this is the caveat to that. That means you're going to have to even turn down some perfectly good opportunities. Not because it's not a good thing, not because it's not uh, helping somebody else, but because it doesn't fall in line with what season God has you in what he's having you to give your time to in this season. And if it's something that God wants to be accomplished in the earth, he's going to raise up that person that needs to do it, right? Because God already has, how many of you know, some of us think that we were born for a purpose. And, and that's fine. That's fine if that's what you think. But you were a pur- purpose before you were even a person. Jeremiah 1 and 5. Anybody? Jeremiah 1 and 5. You were a purpose before you were a person. And the only reason God made you into a person with the unique personality that you have, with those quirks about you, with those characteristics that you have, was to achieve the purpose that he had already designed before the foundation of the earth. That's why you're here. You were a purpose before you were even a person. And I know there are some women in here probably sitting in here today and feeling like, well, thinking about what side of the tracks that you came from and thinking about all the things that you've done and even some of the mistakes that you've made and some consequences you're dealing with because of things you brought on yourself. And you're thinking that you don't have what it takes to really achieve anything great. So you start to humanize God and you start to minimize minimize what you can do or you start to make excuses on why you can't do what God has called you to do. And you're looking through the wrong filter. But how many of you know that when you look at a caterpillar, it shows absolutely no indication that it will ever become a butterfly? Nothing about the caterpillar says it has that type of an amazing destiny ahead of it. And this is the thing. If you just look at where the caterpillar is right now, then you're going to miss out on its amazing destiny. And if you just look at life through a filter that takes into account where you are right now in life, then you're going to be missing out on the potential that's already built inside of you. 
How many of you know that God created that caterpillar? Everything that it needs to reach its destiny is already in it. And if God can do that for a caterpillar, what do you think he's doing for you? But the enemy keeps us looking through these filters that keep us looking at our situation and keeps us looking in the rearview mirror at what we did. And, and, and you know, times we blatantly disobeyed what God said to do. He keeps us replaying all that stuff and keeps us regretting things. And this is the whole deal, y'all. What if the caterpillar told God? He got bowed it one day. Bowed it. Y'all ain't heard that in a long time, right? I know. But he got bold and he told God, well, you know what? Look, I'm not going in the, in the crew, period. Like, I'm not doing it. I'm not going. But do you realize that in order to get to its destiny, the cocoon is the vehicle that God has to use in order to do the work that he has to do on the caterpillar to get it to that place. Did you know that you too have a metamorphosis process in a cocoon that you have to get in? Some of us are looking at that cocoon right now. And you said, uh uh, it's dark in there. It's tight. Mess up my air. <laughs> and we don't want to go in because we're looking at what it's going to take to get there. I wonder what opportunities for growth you've missed out on because you refuse to get in your cocoon. wonder what it is that you're missing out that God really wants to do for you, but he can't do it for you in the state that you're in right now. He has to change some things about you. He has to help make you lose some things in order to be able to appreciate the small things that we have around us. He has to take you through some hard trials. He has to take you through some grieving processes in order to get you built up to be able to last in the destiny that God has for you. I wonder what opportunities you are missing out on because you will not go in your cocoon. But I want you to know something about the cocoon process. And I'm almost done. But I want you to know something about the cocoon process because what happens is that place that seems so horrible, and I know some of us have been through some tragic things, and I'm not negating that. But that place that had you so low, that place that had you so deep down in the muck in the miry clay that you didn't realize or really even know how you ever regained ground, that place that you thought was meant to kill you, that place that you thought that you would die in, that place that you thought was your tomb, was really just your cocoon. It was really just the place that God had to get you in in order to work on you like he needed to because some of us have a lot of options. And sometimes God is our last option. And so sometimes he has to remove some people. He has to remove some things. Sometimes he has to put our bank account in a negative, negative, negative in order to realize that it's not our money it's not about our money. It's not about our title. Sometimes he has to do a mass layoff to let you know it's not about that. He is the one. So those situations that had us so confused and sometimes questioning God, this is the whole thing. Sometimes we put more faith in a chair than we do in God. How do I know this? Ask yourself, when was the last time you questioned your chair on its ability to hold you up before you sat down in it? Ask, no, 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 no. Seriously, ask, think about it. When was the last time you questioned your chair on its ability to hold you up before you chose whether or not you were going to sit in it? Probably next to never. Now, you got some weird folk out there that do talk to chairs and talk to trees and all that. I'm not talking about those people. But really, when was the last time? But I bet you you can think of a time, maybe even on today, that you questioned God about, God, what are you doing? What in the world. But we've got to look through life through the filter of faith. We've got to have the right frame. We've got to have the right focus. And we've got to have the right filter. We've got to have the right frame. We've got to have the right focus. And we've got to have the right filter in order to live a life in balance, in order to become the masterpiece
that God has ultimately designed you to be, because we all are. I don't care what anybody told you, what anybody's made you believe about yourself, but you are a masterpiece. And how many of you know it's possible to become a masterpiece even when you're in pieces? But ladies, that is it for me. But I want you to remember to have the right frame, the right focus, know your season. If you are going to be effective, you have to walk in your season. If you don't know what your season is, ask God to show you where you're supposed to be right now. Forget about what you did in the, in the past because a lot of times when we're holding on to that success, we hold on to that what happened in the 80s and what happened in the 60s, and we're holding on to that, and we plateau off in life, and we never shoot for more. But God, ask God to show you what do I need to shoot for now. Greater works will you do. Ask God, what do I need to shoot for in this season? Yes, I'm divorced, but God, you didn't put me in this place for, any, for no reason, God. So show me what I'm supposed to do in this season. Yes, I lost a child, but God, show me what I'm supposed to do with that for this season of life for me. Ask God to show you. God doesn't want you to be ignorant of his will. And as a matter of fact, he gives you his will. It's called the Bible. It's the known will of God. And so when you are in your Bible, when you are in your word, when you are seeking God like crazy, God will show himself to you in ways that you could not even imagine. That Ephesians 3 and 20, that exceedingly above, beyond what we could ever ask to think, when you look that word up, that means that super abundantly exceedingly abundant, super abundant, hyper abundant. That means that God is going to hype. Have you ever hyper extended your elbow or heard of that when people extend it beyond its normal range of reach? That's what God is saying to do. He's going to hyper extend his blessings over your life. He's going to extend that blessing beyond. He's going beyond. And God is wanting to do that for you, but some of us won't let him. But I want you to put the right filter on it, the filter of faith. Have the right frame, the right focus, and the right filter. God bless you.